Hello, how are you guys? Two streams in a day. Oh, I didn't see that you hosted. I'm so sorry, Terror. My bot had only announced Riddies and I had stepped away for a minute. So I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to disregard your host. I appreciate the host as well. Here I am again. I appreciate you. This is going to be obviously a more chill stream, so... <clears throat> If you need to lurk and do your thing, you go ahead and do that. That won't offend me at all. Um, yeah, I don't think, I just don't think they announce auto hosts, like the bots and stuff, but, and the alerts, but. I appreciate it. I appreciate you all for being here. Um, so this is going to be installment three of four of this uh, book. Um, I'm, we have six chapters left, so I'm going to do three more tonight, and then three more in the final part, and then we will officially be on the last book of the series. So, it's taken me, oh, I don't know, three years to do the series, but I appreciate everybody who has been patient while I get this done, um, and still allowing me to do other projects as well. So, <clears throat> oh my god, cute. I'm glad you're here as well. Hello to everyone, and, um... I assume that the audio is okay. Uh, just yell at me if it is not. As always, I will adjust as needed. Um, it kind of seems like it might be a little loud, but maybe there is okay. We'll go there. Oh, audio is okay. I always get nervous that it's a little loud. Tell me if I, if I put it down a little too much right there. As long as it's as long as audio is still okay then we're good we're good okay we're good all right okie doke well, then we will jump into chapter eight <clears throat> chapter eight the word denouement is not only the name of a hotel or the family who manages it particularly nowadays when the hotel and all its secrets have almost been forgotten and the surviving members of the family have changed their names and are working in smaller, less glamorous inns. Denouement comes from the French, who used the word to describe the act of untying a knot, and it refers to the unraveling of a confusing or mysterious story, such as the lives of the Baudelaire orphans or anyone else you know whose life is filled with unanswered questions. The denouement is the moment when all of the knots of a story are untied and all the threads are unraveled, and everything is laid out clearly for the world to see. But the denouement should not be confused with the end of a story. The denouement of Snow White, for instance, occurs at the moment when Miss White wakes up from her, un her enchanted sleep and decides to leave the dwarves behind and marry the handsome prince, and the mysterious old woman who gave her an apple has been exposed as the treacherous queen. queen. But the end of Snow White occurs many years later, when a horseback riding accident plunges Miss White into a fever from which she never recovers. The denouement of Goldilocks and the Three Bears occurs at the moment when the bears return home to find Goldilocks napping on their private property, 
and either chase her away from the premises or eat her, depending on which version you have in your library. But the end of Goldilocks and the Three Bears occurs when a troop of young scouts neglect to extinguish their campfire and even the efforts of a volunteer fire department cannot save most of the wildlife from certain death. There are some stories in which the denouement and the end occur simultaneously, such as La Forza del Destino, in which the characters recognize and destroy one another over the course of a single song. But usually the denouement of a story is not the last event in the hero's lives, or the last trouble that befalls them. It is often the second to last event, or the penultimate peril. As the Baudelaire orphans followed the mysterious man out of the hotel and through the cloud of steam to the edge of the reflective pond, the denouement of their story was fast approaching, but the end of their story still waited for them, like a secret still covered in fog, or a distant island in the midst of a troubled sea, whose waves raged against the shores of a city and the walls of a perplexing hotel. You must have thousands of questions, Baudelaire's, said the man, and just think, right here is where they can be answered. Who are you? Violet asked. I'm Dewey Denouement, Dewey Denouement replied. The third triplet. Haven't you heard of me? No, Klaus said. We thought there was only Frank and Ernest. Frank and Ernest get all the attention, Dewey said. They get to walk around the hotel managing everything while I just hide in the shadows and wind the clock. He gave the Baudelaire's an enormous sigh and scowled into the depths of the pond. That's what I don't like about VFD, he said. All the smoke and mirrors. Smoke? Sunny asked. Smoke and mirrors, Klaus explained, means trickery used to cover up the truth. But what does that have to do with VFD? Before the schism, Dewey said, VFD was like a public library. Anyone could join us and have access to all of the information we'd acquired. Volunteers all over the globe were reading each other's research, learning of each other's observations, and borrowing each other's books. For a while, it seemed as if we might keep the whole world safe, secure, and smart. It must have been a wonderful time, Klaus said. I scarcely remember it, Dewey said. I was four years old when the schism began. I was scarcely tall enough to reach my favorite shelf in the family library. The books labeled O2O. But one night, just as our parents were hanging balloons for our fifth birthday party, my brothers and I were taken. Taken where? Violet asked. Taken by whom? Sonny asked. I admire your curiosity, Dewey said. The woman who took me said that one can remain alive long past the usual date of disintegration if one is unafraid of change, insatiable in intellectual curiosity, interested in big things and happy in small ways, and she took me to a place high in the mountains where she said such things would be encouraged. Klaus opened his commonplace book and began to take furious notes. The headquarters, Klaus said, in the Valley of Four Drafts. Your parents must have missed you, Violet said. They perished that very night, Dewey said, in a terrible fire. I don't have to tell you how badly I felt when I learned that news. The Baudelaire sighed and looked out at the pond. Here and there on its calm surface they could see the reflections of a few lights in the windows, but most of the hotel was dark, so most of the pond was dark too. The triplet, of course, did not have to tell the Baudelaire's how it felt to lose one's parents so suddenly or at such a young age. It was not always this way, Baudelaire's, Dewey said. Once there were safe places scattered across the globe, and so orphans like yourself did not have to wander from place to place trying to find noble people who could be of assistance. With each generation, the schism gets worse. If justice does not prevail, soon there will be no safe places left, and nobody left to remember how the world ought to be. I don't understand, Violet said. Why weren't we taken like you? You were, Dewey said. You were taken into the custody of Count Olaf, and he tried to keep you in custody no matter how many noble people intervened. But why didn't anyone tell us what was going on? Klaus asked. Why did we have to figure things out all by ourselves? I'm afraid that's the wicked way of the world, Dewey said with a shake of his head. Everything's covered in smoke and mirrors, Baudelaire's. Since the schism, all the research, all the observations, even all of the books have been scattered all over the globe. It's like the elephant in the poem your father loved. Everyone has their hands on a tiny piece of the truth, but nobody can see the whole thing. Very soon, however, that will all change. Thursday, Sonny said. 
Exactly, Dewey said, smiling down at the youngest Baudelaire. At long last, all of the noble people will be gathered together, along with all of the research they've done, all the observations they've made, all the evidence they've collected, and all the books they've read. Just as a library catalog can tell you where a certain book is located, this catalog can tell you the location and behavior of every volunteer and every villain. He gestured to the hotel. For years, he said, while noble people wandered the world observing treachery, my comrade and I have been right here gathering all the information together. We've copied every note from every commonplace book from every volunteer and compiled it all into a catalog. Occasionally, when volunteers have been lost or safe places destroyed, we've had to go ourselves to collect the information that's been left behind. We've retrieved Josephine Ann Whistle's files from Lake Lacrimose and carefully copied down their contents. We've pasted together the burnt scraps of Madame Lulu's archival library and taken notes on what we've found. We've searched the childhood home of the man with a beard but no hair and interviewed the math teacher of the woman with hair but no beard. We've memorized important articles within the stacks of newspaper in Paltryville, and we've thrown important items out of windows of our destroyed headquarters so they might wind up somewhere safe at sea. We've taken every crime, every theft, every wicked deed, and every incident of rudeness since the schism began and cataloged them into an entire library of misfortune. Eventually, every crucial secret ends up in my catalog. It's been my life's work. It has not been an easy life, but it has been an informative one. You're more than a volunteer, Violet said. You're a librarian. I'm more of a sub-sub-librarian, Dewey said modestly. That's what your parents used to call me because my library work has been largely undercover and underground. Every villain in the world would want to destroy all this evidence, so it's been necessary to hide my life's work away. But where could you hide something that enormous? Klaus said. It would be like hiding an elephant. A catalog that immense would have to be as big as the hotel itself. It is, Dewey said with a sly expression on his face. In fact, it's exactly as big as this hotel. Violet and Klaus turned their gaze from Dewey to look at one another in confusion, but Sunny was gazing, gazing neither at the sub-sub-librarian nor at her siblings, but down at the dark surface of the pond. Aha, she said, pointing a small gloved finger at the calm, still water. Exactly, Dewey said. The truth has been right under everyone's noses, if anyone cared to look past the surface. Volunteers and villains alike know that the last safe place is the Hotel de Numa, but no one has ever questioned why the sign is written backward. They're staying in the de Numa Hotel, while the real last safe place, the catalog, is hidden safely at the bottom of the pond, in underwater rooms organized in a mirror image of the hotel itself. Our enemies could burn the entire building to the ground, but the most important secrets would be safe. But if the location of the catalog is such an important secret, Violet said, why are you telling us? Because you should know, Dewey said. You've wandered the world, observing more villainy and gathering more evidence than most people do in a lifetime. I'm sure the observations and evidence you've gathered in your commonplace book will be valuable contributions to the catalog. Who better than you to keep the world's most important secrets? He looked out at the pond, and then at each orphan in turn. After Thursday, he continued, you won't have to be at sea anymore, Baudelaire's. The children knew by the, that by the expression at sea, he meant lost and confused, and hearing those words brought tears to their eyes. I hope you decide to make this your permanent home. I need someone with an inventive imagination who can improve on the aquatic design of the catalog. I need someone with the sort of research skills that can expand the catalog until it is the finest in the world. And of course we'll need to eat, and I've heard wonderful things about Sunny's cooking. F. Choristo, Sunny said modestly. Hal's meals are atrocious, I'm afraid, Dewey said with a rueful smile. I don't know why he insisted on opening his restaurant in room 954 when so many other suitable rooms were available. Bad food of any style is unpleasant, but bad Indian food is possibly the worst. Hal is a volunteer? Klaus asked, remembering what Sunny had observed during her errands at a, as a concierge. In a manner of speaking, Dewey said, using, using an expression which means sort of. After the fire that destroyed Heimlich Hospital, 
my comrade arrived on the scene to catalog any information that might have survived. She found Hal in a very distraught condition. His library of records was in shambles, and he had nowhere to live. She offered him a position at the Hotel de Numont, where he might aid us in our research and learn to cook. Unfortunately, he's only been good at one of those things. Well, what about Charles? Violet asked, remembering what Klaus had observed during his errands. Charles has been searching for you since you left the lumber mill, Dewey said. He cares for you, Baudelaire's, despite the selfish and dreadful behavior of his partner. You've seen your share of wicked people, Baudelaire's, but you've seen your share of people as noble as you are. I'm not sure we are noble, Klaus said quietly, flipping the pages of his, of his commonplace book. We caused those accidents at the lumber mill. We're responsible for the destruction of the hospital. We helped start the fire that destroyed Madame Lulu's archival library. We... Enough, Dewey interrupted gently, putting a hand on Klaus's shoulder. You're noble enough, Baudelaire's, and that is all we can ask for in this world. The middle Baudelaire hung his head, so he was leaning against the sub-sub-librarian, and his sisters huddled against him, and all four volunteers stood for a moment silently in the dark. Tears fell from the eyes of the orphans, all four of them, and with as many tears shed that night, they could not have said exactly why they were crying, although I know why I am crying as I type this, and it is not because of the onions that someone is slicing in the next room or because of the wretched curry he's planning on making with them. I am crying because Dewey Denouement was wrong. He was not wrong when he said the Baudelaire's were noble enough, although I suppose many people might argue about such a thing if they were sitting around a room together without a deck of cards or something good to read. Dewey was wrong when he said that being noble enough is all we can ask for in this world, because we can ask for much more than that. We can ask for a second helping of pound cake, even though someone has made it quite clear we will not get any. We can ask for a new watercolor set, even though it will be pointed out that we never used the old one and that all of the paints dried into a crumbly mess. We can ask for Japanese fighting fish to keep us company in our bedroom, and we can ask for a special camera that will allow us to take photographs even in the dark for obvious reasons. And we can ask for an extra sugar cube in our coffees in the morning and an extra pillow in our beds at night. We can ask for justice, and we can ask for a handkerchief, and we can ask for cupcakes, and we can ask for all the soldiers in the world to lay down their weapons and join us in a rousing chorus of Cry Me a River if that happens to be our favorite song. But we can also ask for something that we are much more likely to get, and that is to find a person or two somewhere in our travels who will tell us that we are noble enough, whether it is true or not. We can ask for someone who will say you are noble enough and remind us of our good qualities when we have forgotten them, or cast them into doubt. Most of us, of course, have parents and friends who tell us such things. After we have lost a badminton tournament or failed to capture a notorious counterfeiter who we have discovered aboard a certain motorboat. But the Baudelaire orphans, of course, had no living parents, and their closest friends were high in the sky, in a self-sustaining hot airmobile home, battling eagles and a terrible henchman who had hooks instead of hands. So the acquaintance of Dewey Denouement and the comforting words he had uttered were a blessing. The Baudelaire stood with the sub-sub librarian grateful for this blessing, and at the sound of an approaching automobile, they looked to see two more blessings arriving via taxi and were grateful all over again. Baudelaire's, called a familiar voice. Baudelaire's, called another one. The siblings peered through the dark at the two figures emerging from the taxi, scarcely able to believe their eyes. These people were wearing strange eyeglasses made of two large cones that were attached to their heads with a mass of tangled rope, which was coiled up on top of their heads. Such glasses might have concealed the identity of the people who were wearing them, but the Baudelaire's had no trouble recognizing the people who were hurrying toward them, even though they had not seen either person for a very long time, and had thought they would never see them again. "'Justice Strauss?' Violet cried. "'Jerome Squalor?' Klaus cried. J.S., Sunny cried. I'm so happy to find you, said the judge, taking off her vision furthering device so she could dab at her eyes and embrace the children one by one. I was afraid I'd never see you again. I'll never forgive myself for letting that idiotic banker take you away from me. And I'll never forgive myself, said Jerome, who had the misfortune of being married to Esme Squalor. 
for walking away from you children. I'm afraid I wasn't a very good guardian. And I'm afraid I wasn't a guardian at all, just as Strauss said. As soon as you were taken away in that automobile, I knew I had done the wrong thing. And when I heard the dreadful news about Dr. Montgomery, I began searching for you. Eventually, I found other people who were also trying to battle the wicked villains of this world. But I always hoped I would find you myself, if only to say how sorry I was. I'm sorry too, Jerome said. As soon as I heard about all the trouble that befell you in the village of Fal Devotees, I began my own Baudelaire search. Volunteers were leaving me messages everywhere. At least I thought the messages were addressed to me. And I thought they were addressed to me, Justice Strauss said. There are certainly plenty of people with the initials J.S. I began to feel like an imposter, Jerome said. You're not imposters, Dewey said. You're volunteers. He turned to the Baudelaire's. Both these people have helped us immeasurably, he said, using a word which here means a whole lot. Justice Strauss has reported the details of your case to the other judges in the high court, and Jerome Squalor has done some critical research on injustice. I was inspired by my wife, Jerome confessed, removing his vision-furthering device. Wherever I looked for you, Baudelaire's, I found selfish plots to steal your fortune. I read books on injustice in all the libraries you left behind and eventually wrote a book myself. Odious Lusting After Finance chronicles the history of greedy villains, treacherous girlfriends, bungling bankers, and all the other people responsible for injustice. No matter what we do, however, Justice Strauss said, we can't erase the wrongs we did to you, Baudelaire's. She's right, Jerome Squalor said. We should have been as noble as you are. You're noble enough. Violet said, and her siblings nodded in agreement, as the judge and the injustice expert embraced them again. When someone has disappointed you, as Justice Strauss and Jerome Squalor disappointed the Baudelaire's, it is often difficult to decide whether to continue their acquaintance, even if the disappointers have done noble things in the meantime. There are some who say that you should forgive everyone, even the people who have disappointed you immeasurably. There are others who say you should not forgive anyone, and should stomp off in a huff no matter how many times they apologize. Of these two philosophies, the second one is of course much more fun, but it can also grow exhausting to stomp off in a huff every time someone has disappointed you, as everyone disappoints everyone eventually, and one can't stomp off in a huff every minute of the day. When the Baudelaire's thought about the harm that each J.S. had done to them, it was as if they had gotten a bruise quite some time ago, one that had mostly faded, but that still hurt when they touched it. And when they touched this bruise, it made them want to stomp off, stomp off in a huff. But on that evening, or more properly, very early Wednesday morning, the siblings did not want to stomp off into the hotel where so many wicked people were gathered, or into the pond, which was likely to be very cold and clammy at this time of night. They wanted to forgive these two adults, and to embrace them, despite their disappointment. I don't mean to break up all of this embracing, Dewey said, but we have work to do, volunteers. As one of the first volunteers said a very long time ago, though boys throw stones at frogs in sport, the frogs do not die in sport, but in earnest. Speaking of frogs, Justice Strauss said, I'm afraid to report that we couldn't see a thing from the other side of the pond. These vision-furthering devices work well in the daytime, but looking through special sunglasses after sunset makes everything look as dark as a crow flying through the pitch-black night, which is precisely what we're looking for. Justice Strauss is correct, Jerome said sadly. We couldn't verify the arrival of the crows or whether their journey was interrupted. We couldn't see if even a single crow was trapped, the judge said, or if the sugar bowl fell into the funnel. Funnel? Dewey repeated. Yes, Justice Strauss said. You told us that if our enemies shot down the crows, they would have fallen onto the bird paper. And if the crows fell onto the bird paper, Jerome continued, then the sugar bowl would drop into the laundry room, right? Dewey looked slyly at the steaming funnel and then at the surface of the pond. So it would appear, <clears throat> he said, our enemies capturing the sugar bowl would be as troubling as their capture of the medusoid mycelium. So you already know about the plan to shoot down the crows and capture the sugar bowl? Violet said incredulously. Yes, Dewey said. Justice Strauss learned that the harpoon gun had been taken up to the rooftop sunbathing salon. Jerome noticed that bird paper was dangling out of the window of the sauna in room 613, and I gave Sunny the lock myself so she could lock up the laundry in room 025. 
You know about all the villainous people who are lurking in the hotel? Klaus said equally incredulously. Yes, just as Strauss said. We observed rings on all the wooden furniture from people refusing to use coasters. Obviously, there are many villains staying in the hotel. Mycelium? Sunny asked with perhaps just a touch more incredulousness than her siblings. Yes, Jerome said. We've learned that Olaf has managed to acquire a few spores locked tight in a diving helmet. The Baudelaire's looked at the commonplace book in Klaus's hands and then back at the sub-sub librarian. I guess our observations and evidence aren't such valuable contributions after all, Violet said. All the mysteries we've encountered in the hotel have already been solved. It doesn't matter, Baudelaire's, Jerome said. Olaf won't dare unleash the medusoid mycelium unless he gets his hands on the sugar bowl, and he'll never find that. I'm the only one who knows which words will unlock the vernacularly fastened door, Dewey said, ushering the children back toward the entrance of the hotel. And there's not a villainous person on earth who has done enough reading to guess them before Thursday. By then, all of the volunteers will present the research they've done on Count Olaf and his associates to the prosecution, and all their treachery will finally end. Jerome Squalor will be an important witness, Justice Strauss said. His comprehensive history of injustice will help the High Court reach a verdict. Prosecution? Violet asked. Witness? Klaus asked. Verdict? Sunny asked. The three adults smiled at one another, and then at the Baudelaire's. That's what we've been trying to tell you, Dewey said gently. VFD has researched an entire catalog of Olaf's treachery. On Thursday, Justice Strauss and the other judges of the High Court will hear from each and every one of our volunteers. Count Olaf, Esme Squalor, and all of the other villainous people gathered here will finally be brought to justice. You'll never have to hide from Olaf again, Jerome said, or worry that anyone will steal your fortune. Just have, we just have to wait for tomorrow, Baudelaire's, Justice Strauss said, and your troubles will finally be over. It's like my comrade always says, Dewey said. Right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. Wrong. The clanging of the clock announced that it was one in the morning, and without another word, Dewey took Violet's hand, and Justice Strauss took Klaus's, and Jerome Squalor leaned down and took Sonny's hand, and the three adults led the three orphans up the stairs toward the hotel's entrance, walking past the taxi which was still there, engine purring, with the figure of the driver just a shadow in the window. The three adults smiled at the children, and the children smiled back, but of course the Baudelaire's were not born yesterday, an expression which means young or innocent enough to believe things certain people say about the world. If the Baudelaire's had been born yesterday, perhaps they would be innocent enough to believe that all of their troubles were truly about to end, and that Count Olaf and all of his treacherous associates would be judged by the High Court, and condemned to the proper punishment for all their ignoble deeds, and that the children would spend the rest of their days working with Dewey Denouement on his enormous underwater catalog if they only waited for tomorrow. But the three siblings were not born yesterday. Violet was born more than 15 years before this particular Wednesday, and Klaus was born approximately two years after that, and even Sonny, who had just passed out of babyhood, was not born yesterday. Neither were you, unless of course I am wrong. In which case, welcome to the world, little baby, and congratulations on learning to read so early in life. But if you were not born yesterday, and you have read anything about the Baudelaire children's lives, then you cannot be surprised that this happy moment was almost immediately cut short by the appearance of a most unwelcome person at the moment the children were led through the fog of steam coming from the laundry room funnel and through the entrance of the Hotel de Noumont as the one loud wrong faded into nothing. This person was standing in the center of the lobby his tall, lean body bent into a theatrical pose as if he were waiting for a crowd to applaud, and you will not be surprised to know what was tattooed on his ankle, which the children could see poking out of a hole in his sock, even in the dim light of the room. You were not born yesterday, probably, so you will not be surprised to find that this notorious villain had reappeared in the Baudelaire's lives for the penultimate time, and the Baudelaire's were also not born yesterday, so they were also not surprised. They were not born yesterday, but when Count Olaf turned to face them and gazed upon them with his shiny, shiny eyes, the Baudelaire orphans wished they had not been born at all. That's the end of chapter eight. Let's catch up!
when did I get dinosaur emotes? Twetchuous queen. 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 <laughs> yeah, it was hard to say that. Are you hungry again? Sprinklesaurus. Hi, Sprinklesaurus. Are we in Asia? What do you mean? That's a long way back home for me. Come on, scroll down, bot. There we go. I just don't want to suddenly wind up in an unknown land after walking back into my home door. Narnia, Wizard of Oz style. Archives and libraries are two different things. Melville Dewey was not a fun person. And unfortunately, the Dewey Decimal System is not always everyone's friend. Having fun isn't hard when you got a library card. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, no, it's fine. Eat. We need to eat. Archival library is really irritating me. You either have one or the other. I think it was more at archives. I stepped away from it. Please, no wretched curry. I will lurk whenever this chapter is over and be response. Okay. Are there no archives where you can check out an item within the building? It's just an archive. You don't have to say library. Justin Timberlake reference? Wait, what was a Justin Timberlake reference? I I don't know if it's a granny sweater. It's kind of just a sweater. It's cream colored. There's there's like a, a random buckle on this side, but not on this side, which I don't understand. But it got up to 70 degrees. It wasn't that warm today here tossing a bone toy hello twinks now we're never gonna give you up never gonna let you down I know a person who goes off into a huff every time I say a word to that person where are they can I beat them up you shouldn't could <laughs> reading hard claps thank you oh the music oh cry me a river I don't know is there there's are there multiple songs called cry me a river I don't know I'm not familiar enough. All right, all caught up. <clears throat> oh, when I said hello to Twix, she woke up. Sorry for waking you up, Twix. I'm gonna move this just a little bit. Sorry for noise. Okay. <clears throat> Everybody still doing good? My earlobe is like sore and I can't figure out why. Bork! Okay. <clears throat> Moving along. Chapter 9. Ha! Count Olaf shrieked, pointing at the Baudelaire orphans with a bony finger. And the children were thankful for small mercies. A small mercy is simply a tiny thing that has gone right in a world gone wrong. Like a sprig of delicious parsley next to a spoiled tuna sandwich. Or a lovely dandelion in a garden that is being devoured by vicious goats. A small mercy, like a small fly swatter, is unlikely to be of any real help. But nevertheless, the three siblings, even in their horror and disgust at seeing Olaf again... We're thankful for the small mercy that the villain had apparently lost interest in his new laugh. The last time the Baudelaire's had seen the villain, he'd been aboard a strange submarine shaped like an octopus, and he'd developed a laugh that was equally strange, full of snorts and squeaks and words that happened to begin with the letter H. But as the villain strode toward the children and the adults who were clutching their hands, it was clear he had since adopted a style of laughter that was succinct, a word which here means only the word HA. Ha! he cried. I knew I'd find you orphans again. Ha! 
and now you're in my clutches. Ha! We're not in your clutches, Violet said. We just happen to be standing in the same room. That's what you think, orphan, Olaf sneered. I'm afraid the man who's holding your hand is one of my associates. Hand her over, Ernest. Ha! How yourself, Olaf, said Dewey Denouement. His voice was firm and confident, but Violet felt his hand trembling in hers. I'm not Ernest, and I'm not handing her over. Well, then hand her over, Frank, Olaf said. You might consider doing your hair differently so I could tell you apart. I'm not Frank either, Dewey said. You can't fool me, Count Olaf growled. I wasn't born yesterday, you know. You're one of those idiotic twins I should know. Thanks to me, you two are the only survivors of the entire family. Triplets run in my family, Dewey said. Not twins. I'm Dewey Denouement. At this, Count Olaf's one eyebrow raised in astonishment. Dewey Denouement? He murmured. So you're a real person? I always thought you were a legendary figure like Unicorns or Giuseppe Verde. Giuseppe Verdi is not a legendary figure, Klaus said indignantly. He's an operatic composer. Silence, bookworm, Olaf ordered. Children should not speak while adults are arguing. Hand over the orphans, adults. Nobody's handing over the Baudelaire's, Justice Strauss said, clutching Klaus's hand. You have no legal right to them or their fortune. You can't just grab children as if they were pieces of fruit in a bowl, Jerome Squalor cried. It's injustice and we won't have it. You'd better watch yourselves, Count Olaf said, narrowing his shiny eyes. I have associates lurking everywhere in this hotel. So do we, Dewey said. Many volunteers have arrived early, and within hours the streets will be flooded with taxis carrying noble people here to this hotel. How can you be sure they're noble people? Count Olaf asked. A taxi will pick up anyone who signals for one. These people are associates of ours. Dewey said fiercely. They won't fail us. Ha! Count Olaf said. You can't rely on associates. More comrades have failed me than I can count. Why, Hookie and Fiona double-crossed me just yesterday and let you brats escape. Then they double-crossed me again and stole my submarine. We can rely on our friends, Violet said quietly, more than you can rely on yours. Is that so? Count Olaf asked and leaned toward the children with a ravenous smile. Have you learned nothing after all your adventures? He asked. Every noble person has failed you, Baudelaire's. Why look at the idiot standing next to you, a judge who let me marry you, a man who gave up on you altogether, and a sub-sub librarian who spends his life sneaking around taking notes. They're hardly a noble bunch. Charles is here from Lucky Smells Lumber Mill, Klaus said. He cares about us. Sir is here, Olaf retorted. He doesn't. Ha! <laughs> How, Sonny said. Vice Principal Nero and Mr. Ramoro. Rem Mr. Ramora, Olaf replied, counting each nasty person on his filthy fingers. And that pesky little reporter from the Daily Punctilio who's here to write silly articles praising my cocktail party. And ridiculous Mr. Poe who arrived just hours ago to investigate a bank robbery. Ha! <laughs> Those people don't count, Klaus said. They're not associates of yours. They might as well be, Count Olaf replied. They've been an enormous help. And every second, more associates of mine get closer and closer. So do our friends, Violet said. They're flying across the sea as we speak, and by tomorrow, their self-sustaining hot air mobile home will land on the roof. Only if they've managed to survive my eagles, Count Olaf said with a growl. They will, Klaus said, just like we've survived you. And how did you survive me? Count Olaf asked. The Daily Punctilio is full of your crimes. You lied to people. You stole. You abandoned people in danger. You set fires. You abandoned people... Time after time, you've relied on treachery to survive, just like everyone else. There are no truly noble people in this world. Our parents, Sonny said fiercely. Count Olaf looked surprised that Sonny had spoken, and then gave all three Baudelaire's a smile that made them shudder. I guess the sub-sub librarian hasn't told you the story about your parents, he said, and a box of poisoned darts. Why don't you ask him, orphans? Why don't you ask this legendary librarian about that fateful evening at the opera? 
The Baudelaire's turned to look at Dewey, who had begun to blush. But before they could ask him anything, they were interrupted by a voice coming from a pair of sliding doors that had quietly opened. Don't ask him that, Esme Squalor said. I have a much more important question. With a mocking laugh, the treacherous girlfriend emerged from the elevator, her silver sandals clumping on the floor and her lettuce leaves rustling against her skin. Behind her was Carmelita Spatz, who was still wearing her ball-playing cowboy superhero soldier pirate outfit and carrying the harpoon gun Violet had delivered. And behind her, three more people emerged from the elevator. First came the attendant from the rooftop sunbathing salon, still wearing green sunglasses and a long baggy robe. Following the attendant was the mysterious chemist from outside the sauna, dressed in a long white coat and a surgical mask. And last out of the elevator was the washerwoman from the laundry room, with a long blonde hair and rumpled clothing. The Baudelaire's recognized these people from their observations as flaneurs, but then the attendant removed his robe to reveal his back, which had a small hump on the so shoulder, and the chemist removed her surgical mask, not with one of her hands, but with one of her feet, and the washerwoman removed a long blonde wig with both hands at the exact same time, and the three siblings recognized the three hench folk all over again. Hugo? cried Violet. Colette? cried Klaus. Kevin? cried Sonny. Esme? cried Jerome. Why isn't anybody calling out my name? demanded Carmelita, stomping one of her bright blue boots. She pranced toward Violet, who observed that two of the four long, sharp hooks were missing from the weapon. This sort of observation may be impor important for a flaneur, but it is dreadful for any reader of this book, who probably does not want to know where the remaining harpoons will end up. I'm a ball-playing cowboy superhero soldier pirate, she crowed to the oldest Baudelaire, and you're nothing but a cake sniffer. Call my name or I'll shoot you with this harpoon gun. Carmelita, Esme said, her silver mouth twisting into an expression of shock. Don't po point that gun at Violet. Esme's right, Count Olaf said. Don't waste the harpoons. We may need them. Yes, Esme cried. There's always important work to do before a cocktail party, particularly if you want it to be the innest in the world. We need to put slipcovers on the couches and hide our associates beneath them. We need to put vases of flowers on the piano and electric eels in the fountain. We need to hang streamers and volunteers from the ceiling. We need to play music so people can dance and block the exits so they can't leave. And most of all, we have to cook in, in food and prepare in cocktails. Food and drink are the most important aspect of every social occasion. And our in recipes, the most important aspect of every social occasion is not food or drink, Dewey interrupted indignantly. It's conversation. You're the one who should flee, Justice Strauss said. Your cocktail party will be canceled due to the host and hostess being brought to justice by the high court. You're as foolish as you were when we were neighbors, Count Olaf said. The high court can't stop us. VFD can't stop us. Hidden somewhere in this hotel is one of the most deadly fungi in the entire world. When Thursday comes, this fungus will come out of hiding and destroy everyone it touches. At last, I'll be free to steal the Baudelaire fortune and perform any other act of treachery that springs to mind. You won't dare unleash the medusoid mycelium, Dewey said. Not while I have the sugar bowl. Funny you should mention the sugar bowl, Esme Squalor said, although the Baudelaire's couldn't see sh could see she didn't think it was funny at all. That's just what we wanted to ask you about. The sugar bowl? Count Olaf asked, his eyes shining bright. Where is it? The freaks will tell you, Esme said. It's true, boss, said Hugo. I may be a mere hunchback, but I saw Carmelita shoot down the crows using the harpoon gun Violet brought her. Justice Strauss turned to Violet in astonishment. You gave Carmelita the harpoon gun? She gasped. Well, yes, Violet said. I had to perform concierge errands as part of my disguise. The harpoon gun was supposed to be kept away from villains, the judge said. Not given to them, why didn't Frank stop you? Violet thought back to her unfathomable conversation with Frank. I think he tried, she said quietly, but I had to take the harpoon gun up to the roof. What else could I do? I hit two crows, bragged Carmelita Spatz. That means County has to teach me how to spit like a real ball-playing cowboy superhero soldier pirate. Don't worry, darling, Esme said. He'll teach you, won't you, Olaf? Count Olaf sighed as if he had better things to do than teach a little girl how to propel saliva out of her mouth. Yes, Carmelita, he said, I'll teach you how to spit. 
Colette took center stage, a phrase which here means stepped forward and twisted her body into an unusual shape. Even a contortionist like me, she said, her mouth moving beneath her elbow, could see what happened after Carmelita shot the crows. They fell right onto the bird paper that Klaus dangled out of the window. You dangled the bird paper out the window? Jerome asked to the middle Baudelaire. Ernest told me to, Klaus said, finally realizing which manager had spoken to him in the sauna. I had to obey him as part of my disguise. You can't just do what everyone tells you to do, Jerome said. What else could I do? Klaus said. When crows hit the bird paper, Kevin said, gesturing with one hand and then the other. They dropped the sugar bowl. I didn't see where it went with either my right eye or my left one, which I'm sad to say are equally strong. But I did see Sonny turn the door of the laundry room into a vernacularly fastened door. Aha! Count Olaf cried. The sugar bowl must have fallen down the funnel. I still don't see why I had to disguise myself as a washerwoman, Kevin said timidly. I could have just been a washer person and not worn this humiliating wig. Or you could have been a noble person, Violet could not help adding, instead of spying on a brave volunteer. What else could I do? Kevin said, shrugging both equals, both shoulders equally high. You could be a volunteer yourself, Klaus said, looking at all of his former carnival co-workers. All of you could stand with us now instead of helping Count Olaf with his schemes. I could never be a noble person, Hugo said sadly. I have a hump on my back. And I'm a contortionist, Colette said. Someone who can bend their body into unusual shapes could never be a volunteer. VFD would never accept an ambidextrous person, Kevin said. It's my destiny to be a treacherous person. Gallimatius! Sonny cried. Nonsense, Dewey said, who understood at once what Sonny had said. I'm ambidextrous myself, and I've managed to do something worthwhile with my life. Being treacherous isn't your destiny, it's your choice. I'm glad you feel that way, as May Squalor said. You have a choice this very moment, Frank. Tell me where the sugar bowl is or else. That's not a choice, Dewey said, and I'm not Frank. Esme frowned. Then you have a choice this very moment, Ernest. Tell me where the sugar bowl is, or Dewey, Sonny said. Esme blinked at the youngest Baudelaire, who noticed that the villainous woman's eyelashes had also been painted silver. What? she asked. It's true, Olaf said. He's the real sub-sub. It turns out he's not legendary like Verdi. Is that so? Esme Squalor said. So, someone has really been cataloging everything that happened between us. It's been my life's work, Dewey said. Eventually, every crucial secret ends up in my catalog. Then you know all about the sugar bowl, Esme said, and what's inside. You know how important that thing was and how many lives were lost in the quest to find it. You know how difficult it was to find a container that could hold it safely, securely, and attractively. You know what it means to the Baudelaire's and what it means to the Snicket's. She took one sandaled step closer to Dewey and stretched out one silver fingernail, the one shaped like an S, until it was almost poking him in the eye. And you know, she said in a terrible voice, that it is mine. Not anymore, Dewey said. Beatrice stole it from me, Esme cried. There are worse things, Dewey said, than theft. At this, the girlfriend gave the sub-sub librarian a chuckle that made the Baudelaire's blood run cold. There certainly are, she said, and strode toward Carmelita Spatz. With one spiky fingernail, the one shaped like an M, she moved the harpoon gun so it was pointing at the triplet. Tell me... How to open that door, she said, or this little girl will harpoon you. I'm not a little girl, Carmelita reminded Esme nastily. I am a ball-playing cowboy superhero soldier pirate, and I'm not going to shoot any more harpoons until County teaches me how to spit. You'll do what we say, Carmelita, Olaf growled. I already purchased that ridiculous outfit for you and that boat for you to prowl the swimming pool. Point that weapon at Dewey this instant. Teach me to spit, Carmelita said. Point the weapon. Teach me to spit. Point the weapon. Teach me to spit. Weapon. Spit. Weapon. Spit. With a raspy roar, Count Olaf roughly yanked the harpoon gun out of Carmelita's hands, knocking her to the floor. I'll never teach you how to spit as long as I live, he shouted. Ha! Darling! 
Esme gasped. You can't break your promise to our darling little girl. I'm not a darling little girl, Carmelita screamed. I'm a ball-playing cowboy superhero soldier pirate. You're a spoiled baby, Olaf corrected. I never wanted a brat like you around anyway. It's about time you were shown some discipline. But discipline is out, Esme said. I don't care what's out and what's in, Count Olaf cried. I'm tired of having a girlfriend obsessed with fashion. All you do is sit around rooftop sunbathing salons while I run around doing all the work. If I hadn't been on the roof, Esme retorted, the sugar bowl would have been delivered to VFD. Besides, I was guarding never mind what you were doing, Olaf said. You're fired. You can't fire me, Esme growled. I quit. Well, you can leave by mutual agreement, Olaf grumbled. And then with another succinct, ha! He lifted the harpoon gun and pointed it at Dewey Denouement. Tell us the three phrases we need to type into the lock in order to open the vernacularly fastened door and search that laundry room. You won't find anything in the laundry room, Dewey said, except piles of dirty sheets, a few washing and drying machines, and some extremely flammable chemicals. I may have a handsome youthful glow, Olaf snarled, but I was not born yesterday. Ha! <laughs> if there's nothing in the laundry room, why did you ha put a VFD lock on the door? Perhaps it's just a decoy, Dewey said, his hand still trembling in violets. Decoy, Olaf said. Decoy is a word with several meanings, the triplet explained. It can refer to a corner of a pond where ducks can be captured, or to an imitation of a duck or other animal used to attract a real specimen, or it can mean something used to distract people, such as a lock on a door that does not contain a certain sugar bowl. If the lock is a decoy sub-sub, Count Olaf sneered, then you won't mind telling me how to open it. Very well, Dewey said, still struggling to sound calm. The first phrase is a description of a medical condition that all three Baudelaire children share. The Baudelaire shared a smile. The second phrase is the weapon that left you an orphan, Olaf, Dewey said. The Baudelaire shared a frown. And the third, Dewey said, is the famous unfathomable question in the best-known novel by Richard Wright. The Baudelaire sisters shared a look of confusion and looked hopefully at Klaus, who slowly shook his head. I don't have time to medically examine the Baudelaire's, Olaf said, or shove my face into any best-known novels. Wicked people will never have time for reading, Dewey said. It's one of the reasons for their wickedness. I've had enough of your games, Count Olaf roared. Ha! <laughs> if I don't hear the exact phrases used to open the lock by the time Esme counts to ten, I will fire this harpoon gun and tear you to shreds. Esme, count to ten. I'm not counting to ten, Esme pouted. pouted. I'm not doing anything for you ever again. I knew it, Jerome said. I knew you could be a noble person again, Esme. You don't have to parade around in an indecent bikini in the middle of the night threatening sub-sub librarians. You can stand with us in the name of justice. Let's not go overboard, Esme said. Just because I'm dumping my boyfriend doesn't mean I'm going to be a goody-goody like you. Justice is out. Injustice is in, that's why it's called injustice. You should do what is right in this world. Justice Strauss said, not just what's fashionable. I understand your situation, Esme. When I was your age, I spent years as a horse thief before realizing, I don't want to hear your boring stories, Count Olaf snarled. The only thing I want to hear are the three exact phrases from Dewey's mouth, or his destiny will be death by harpoon as soon as I say the number ten. One. Stop, Justice Krauss stride. In the name of the law. Two. Stop, Jerome Squalor pleaded, in the name of injustice. Three. Stop, Violet ordered, and her siblings nodded in fierce agreement. The Baudelaire's realized, as I'm sure you have realized, that the adults standing with them were going to do nothing that would stop Count Olaf from reaching ten and pulling the trigger of the harpoon gun, and that Justice Strauss and Jerome Squalor would fail them, as so many noble people had failed them before. But the siblings also knew that this failure would not hurt them, at least not right away. It would hurt Dewey Denouement, and without another word, the three children dropped the hands of the adults and stood in front of the sub-sub librarian, shielding him from harm. You can't harpoon this man, Klaus said to Count Olaf, scarcely believing what he was saying. You'll have to harpoon us first. Or, Sonny said, put down gun. Dewey Denouement looked too amazed to speak, but Count Olaf merely turned his disdainful gaze from the sub-sub librarian to the three children. 
I wouldn't mind harpooning you either, orphans, he said, his eyes shining bright. When it comes to slaughtering people, I'm very flexible. <laughs> Four. Violet took a step toward the Count, who was holding the harpoon gun so it pointed at her chest. Lay down your weapon, Olaf, the eldest Baudelaire said. You don't want to do this wicked thing. Count Olaf blinked, but he did not move the gun. Of course I do, he said. If the sub-sub doesn't tell me how to get the sugar bowl, I'll pull the trigger no matter who's standing in front of me. Ha! <laughs> Five! Klaus took a step forward, joining his sister. You have a choice, he said. You can choose not to pull that trigger. And you could choose death by harpoon! Count Olaf cried. Six! Please, Sunny said, joining her sister. The villain did not move. But standing together, the three Baudelaire's walked closer and closer to the harpoon gun, shielding Dewey all the while. Seven! Please, the youngest Baudelaire said again. The Baudelaire's walked slowly but steadily toward the harpoon gun, their echoing footsteps the only sound in the silent lobby except for Olaf's shrieking of higher and higher numbers. Eight! <clears throat> they walked closer. Nine! The children took one last step and silently put their hands on the harpoon gun, which felt ice cold even through their white gloves. They tried to pull the weapon out of Olaf's hands, but their first guardian did not let go and for a long moment the youngsters and the adult were gathered around the terrible weapon in silence. Violet stared at the hooked tip of one harpoon that was pressed against her chest. Klaus stared straight ahead at the bright red trigger that could press at any moment, and Sunny stared into Olaf's shiny, shiny eyes for even the smallest sign of nobility. "'What else can I do?' the villain asked, so quietly the children could not be sure they had heard him correctly. "'Give us the gun,' Violet said. "'It's not your destiny to do this treacherous deed.' "'Give us the gun,' Klaus said. "'It's not your destiny to be a wicked person.' La Forza del Destino, Sonny said, and then nobody said anything more. It was so quiet in the lobby that the Baudelaire's could hear Olaf draw breath as he got ready to shout the word ten. But then, in an instant, they heard another sound, specifically a very loud cough, and in an instant everything changed, which is the wicked way of the world. In an instant you can light a match and start a fire that can destroy the lives of countless people. In an instant, you can remove a cake from the oven and provide dessert for countless others, assuming that the cake is very large and the others are not very hungry. In an instant, you can change a few words in a poem by Robert Frost and communicate with your associates through a code known as Verse Fluctuation Declaration. And in an instant, you can realize where something is hidden and decide whether you are going to retrieve it or let it stay hidden, where it might never be found and eventually be forgotten by all but a few very well-read and very distraught figures who... <clears throat> are themselves forgotten by all but a few very well-read and very distraught figures who are in turn forgotten and so on and so on and so on and a few more so-ons besides. All this can happen in an instant, as if a single instant is an enormous container capable of holding countless secrets safely, securely, and attractively, such as the countless secrets held in the Hotel de Numont or in the hidden underwater catalog in its rippling reflection. But in this instant, in the hotel's enormous lobby, the Baudelaire orphans heard a cough, as loud as it was familiar. And in this instant, Count Olaf turned to see who was walking into the lobby and hurriedly pushed the harpoon gun into the Baudelaire's hands when he saw a figure wearing pajamas with drawings of money all over them and a bewildered expression on his face. In this instant, the three siblings grasped the weapon, feeling its heavy, dark weight in their hands. And in this instant, the gun slipped from their hands and clattered to the green wooden floor. And in this instant, they heard the red trigger click. And in this instant, the penultimate harpoon was fired with a swoosh and sailed through the enormous domed room and struck someone a fatal blow, a phrase which here means killed one of the people in the room. What's going on? Mr. Poe demanded, for it was not his destiny to be slain by a harpoon, at least not on this particular evening. I could hear people arguing all the way from room 174. What in the world? And in that instant he stopped and gazed in horror at the three siblings. Baudelaire's, he gasped, but he was not the only person gasping. Violet gasped, and Klaus gasped, and Sonny gasped, and Justice Strauss and Jerome Squalor gasped, and Hugo, Colette, and Kevin, who were accustomed to violence from their days as carnival employees and as henchmen to a villain, gasped, and Carmelita Spatz gasped, 
and Esme Squalor gasped and even Count Olaf gasped. Although it is unusual for a villain to gasp unless he is discovering a crucial secret or suffering very great pain. But it was Dewey Denouement who gasped loudest of all, louder even than the wrongs that thundered through the hotel as the clock struck two. Wrong, wrong, the clock thundered, but all the Baudelaire's heard was Dewey's pained, choking gasp as he stumbled backward through the lobby, one hand on his chest and the other clutching the tail end of a harpoon which was stuck out from his body at an odd angle like a drinking straw or a reflection of one of Dewey's skinny arms. Dewey! Violet cried. Dewey! Klaus cried. Denouement! Sonny cried, but the sub-sub librarian did not answer and stumbled backward out of the hotel in silence. For a moment, the children were too shocked to move as they watched him disappear into the cloud of steam rising from the library, the laundry room funnel. But then they ran after him, hurrying down the stairs as they heard a splash from the edge of the pond. By the time the Baudelaire's reached him, he was already beginning to sink, his trembling body making ripples in the water. There are those who say that the world is like a calm pond, and that any time a person does even the smallest thing, it is as if a stone has dropped into the pond, spreading circles of ripples further and further out until the entire world has been changed by one tiny action. But the Baudelaire's could not bear to think of the tiny action of the trigger of the harpoon gun or how the world had changed in just one instant. Instead, they frantically rushed to the edge of the pond as the sub-sub-librarian began to sink. Klaus grabbed one hand and Sonny grabbed the other and Violet reached for his face as if she were comforting someone who'd begun to cry. You'll be okay, Violet cried. Let's get you out of the water. Dewey shook his head and then gave the children a terrible frown as if he were trying to speak but unable to find the words. You'll survive, Klaus said, although he knew both from reading about dreadful events and from the dreadful events in his own life that this simply was not true. Dewey shook his head again. By now only his head was above the surface of the water and his two trembling hands. The children could not see his body or the harpoon, which was a small mercy. We failed you. Sonny said. Dewey shook his head one more time, this time very wildly, in violent disagreement. He opened his mouth and reached one hand out of the water, pointing past the Baudelaire's toward the dark, dark sky as he struggled to utter the word he most wanted to say. Kit, he whispered finally, and then slipping from the grasp of the children, he disappeared into the dark water, and the Baudelaire orphans wept alone, for the mercies denied them and for the wicked, wicked way of the world. It's the end of chapter nine. Let me catch up on chat. Okay. Set fire to everything. Karma Lita. Cake snipper. Hang streamers from the ceiling. Not as shocking if it's in. 15 out of 10 best voice acting. Thank you so much. Karma Lita is worse than theft, for example. Spit weapon. I made Boo Mew. <laughs> Two streams in one day, I know it's craziness. Hi, Disney. Stop in the name of love. They did make a movie. They also have made a Netflix series of the entire book series, which I highly recommend. I just have to show up to ruin the lives of many people. You make many people's lives very happy. That's true. My joke, no! Shush. Fatal. Harpoonality? I'm sorry for the spoiler. Why do the librarians always have to die? Because nobody likes to be quiet. Harpoon in your body does not excuse being rude. People were addressing you and you didn't reply. 
Your library is not very quiet. Oh, I can't scroll down. Thank you for the claps. 2020 best voice acting. I heard 15 out of 20 and I was confused, but you said 15 out of 10. <clears throat> okay. Count Olaf's voice does me a rough. <laughs> that didn't make any sense, but <clears throat> I I'm getting a little, a little rough. I arrived just in time to miss the stream. Oh no, I, I mean, I still have one more chapter to read today. Of course I am visual, not oral. I was only stopping by to say hello. So hello and goodbye. It's good to see you, Mudfoot. Thanks for popping in. I am going to read one more chapter, though. Having to work does me rough. I'm going to eat a piece of this chocolate to kind of get something, like, on my throat. More than just water. And then we'll jump into the last chapter for the day. Mm-hmm. My sister said her screamo bands used to drink honey to soothe their throats. I mean, I'd believe it. Hi, bye, Mudfoot. Have a great day. I mean, I could go make a cup of tea real quick, but I don't want to take that much of a break between chapters. <clears throat> I may just, like, take some of the growl out of my Count Olaf voice. As long as that doesn't upset the internet. <laughs> Which you never know nowadays what's going to upset the internet. No, I'm okay, I think. I'm okay, I think. <clears throat> Olaf is actually V's voice. <laughs> this is her voice acting. Yeah, pretty much everything upsets the internet. This is so true. Alright. <clears throat> last chapter of the day, but not last chapter of the book. Okay. Tell Keegan, rise and shine! I'm very upset by less growl. The internet. <laughs> I like that little harumphing cat. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 10. What was that? A voice called out. It sounded like a harpoon gun being fired, cried another voice. A harpoon gun? Asked the third voice. This is supposed to be a hotel, not a shooting gallery. I heard a splash, cried someone. Me too, agreed someone else. It sounded like someone fell into the pond. The Baudelaire orphans gazed at the settling surface of the pond and saw the reflections of shutters and windows opening on every story of the Hotel de Noumont. Lights went on and the silhouettes of people appeared leaning out of windows and pointing down at the weeping children who were too upset to pay much attention to all the shouting. "'What's all this shouting about?' asked another voice. "'I was fast asleep!' "'It's the middle of the night,' complained someone else. "'Why is everybody yelling?' "'I'll tell you why there's yelling!' yelled someone. Someone was shot with a harpoon gun and fell into the pond. Come back to bed, Bruce, said someone else. I can't sleep if there's murderers on the loose, cried another guest. Amen, brother, said another person. If a crime's been committed, then it's our duty to stand around in our pajamas in the name of justice. I can't sleep anyway, said somebody. That lousy Indian food's kept me up all night. Someone tell me what is going on, cried a voice. The readers of the Daily Punctilio will want to know what's happened. The sound of the voice of Geraldine Julian and the mention of her inaccurate publication forced the children to stop crying, if only for a moment. They knew it would be wise to postpone their grief, a phrase which here means mourn the death of Dewey Denouement at a later time, and make sure that the newspaper printed the truth. There's been an accident, Violet called, not turning her eyes from the surface of the pond. A terrible accident. One of the hotel managers has 
died, Klaus said. Which one? asked a voice from a high window. Frank or Ernest? Dewey, Sonny said. There's no Dewey, said another voice. That's a legendary figure. He's not a legendary figure, Violet said indignantly. He's a sub... Klaus put his hand on his sister's, and the eldest Baudelaire stopped talking. Dewey's catalog is a secret, he whispered. We cannot have it announced in the Daily Punctilio. But truth, Sonny murmured. Klaus is right, Violet said. Dewey asked us to keep his secret, and we cannot fail him. She looked sadly out at the pond and wiped the tears from her eyes. It's... it's the least we can do, she said. I didn't realize this was a sad occasion, said another hotel guest. We should, we should observe everything carefully and intrude only if absolutely necessary. I disagree, said someone in a raspy shout. We should intrude right now and observe only if absolutely, and observe only if absolutely necessary. <clears throat> we should call the authorities, said someone else. We should call the manager. We should call the concierge. We should call my mother. We should look for clues. We could look for weapons. We should look for my mother. We should look for suspicious people. Suspicious people, repeated another voice. But this is supposed to be a nice hotel. Nice hotels are crawling with suspicious people. Someone else remarked, I saw a washerwoman who was wearing a suspicious wig. I saw a concierge carrying a suspicious item. I saw a taxi carrying a suspicious passenger. I saw a cook preparing suspicious food. I saw an attendant holding a suspicious spatula. I saw a man with a suspicious cloud of smoke. I saw a baby with a suspicious lock. I saw a manager wearing a suspicious uniform. I saw a woman wearing suspicious lettuce. I saw my mother. I can't see anything, someone yelled. It's as dark as a crow flying through a pitch black night. I see something right now, cried a voice. There are three suspicious people standing at the edge of the pond. They're the people who were talking to the reporter, cried someone else. They're refusing to show their faces. <gasps> they must be the murderers, cried yet another person. Nobody else would act as suspiciously as that. We'd better hurry downstairs, said one more guest, before they escape. Wow, squealed another voice. Wait until the readers of the Daily Punctilio read the headline, Vicious Murder at Hotel de Noumont. That's much more exciting than an accident. Mob psychology, Sonny said, remembering a term Klaus had taught her shortly before she took her first steps. Sonny's right, said Klaus, wiping his eyes. This crowd is getting angrier and angrier in a moment they'll all believe we're murderers. Maybe we are. Violet said quietly. Poppycock, Sonny said firmly, which meant something like nonsense. Accident. It was an accident, Klaus said, but it was our fault. Partially, Sonny said. It's not for us to decide, Violet said. We should go inside and talk to Justice Strauss and the others. They'll know what to do. Maybe, Klaus said, or maybe we should run. Run? Sonny asked. We can't run. Violet said, if we run, everyone will think we'll, we're murderers. Maybe we are, Klaus pointed out. All the noble people in that lobby have failed us. We can't be sure they'll help us now. Violet heaved a great sigh, her breath still shaky from her tears. Where would we go? She whispered. Anywhere, Klaus said simply. We could go somewhere where no one has ever heard of Count Olaf or VFD. There must be other noble people in the world and we could find them. There are other noble people, Violet said. They're on their way here. Dewey told us to wait until tomorrow. I think we should stay. Tomorrow might be too late, Klaus said. I think we should run. Torn, Sonny said, which meant something along the lines of, I see the advantages and disadvantages of both plans of action. But before her siblings could answer, the children felt a shadow over them and looked up to see a tall, skinny figure standing over them. In the darkness, the children could not see any of his features, only the glowing tip of a skinny cigarette in his mouth. Do you three need a taxi? He asked, and gestured to the automobile that had brought Justice Strauss and Jerome Squalor to the entrance of the hotel. The siblings looked at one another, and then squinted up at the man. The children thought perhaps his voice was familiar, but it might just have been his unfathomable tone, which they'd heard so many times since their arrival at the hotel that it made everything seem familiar and mysterious at the same time. We're... We're not sure, Violet said after a moment. You're not sure? The man asked. Whenever you see someone in a taxi, they are probably being driven to do some errand. 
Surely there must be something you need to do, or somewhere you need to go. A great American novelist wrote that people travel faster now, but she wasn't sure if they'd do better things. Maybe you would do better things if you traveled at this very moment? We haven't any money, Klaus said. You needn't worry about money, the man said. Not if, who you're th I, not if you're who I think you are. He leaned in toward the Baudelaire's. Are you? he asked. Are you who I think you are? The children looked at each other again. They had no way of knowing, of course, if this man was a volunteer or an enemy, a noble man or a treacherous person. In general, of course, a stranger who tries to get you into an automobile is anything but noble. And in general, a person who quotes great American novelists is anything but treacherous. And in general, a man who says you needn't worry about money, or a man who smokes cigarettes is somewhere in between. But the Baudelaire orphans were not standing in general. They were standing outside the Hotel de Noumont, at the edge of a pond where a great secret was hidden, while a crowd of guests grew more and more suspicious about the terrible thing that had just occurred. The children thought of Dewey and remembered the terrible, terrible sight of him sinking into the pond, and they realized they had no way of knowing if they themselves were good or evil, let alone the mysterious man towering over them. We don't know, Sonny said finally. Baudelaire's! came a sharp voice at the top of the stairs, followed by a fit of coughing. And the siblings turned to see Mr. Poe, who was staring at the children and covering his mouth with a white handkerchief. "'What has happened?' he asked. "'Where is that man you shot with the harpoon?' The Baudelaire's were too weary and unhappy to argue with Mr. Poe's description of what happened. "'He's... he's dead,' Violet said, and found that tears were in her eyes once more. Mr. Poe coughed once more in astonishment and then stepped down the stairs and stood in front of the children whose welfare had been his responsibility. Dead, he said. How did that happen? It's difficult to say, Klaus said. Difficult to say, Mr. Poe frowned. I saw you, Baudelaire's. You were holding the weapon. Surely you can tell me what happened. Henri Bergson, Sonny said, which meant it's more complicated than that. But Mr. Poe only shook his head as if he'd heard enough. "'You'd better come inside,' he said with a weary sigh. "'I must say I'm very disappointed in you children. "'When I was in charge of your affairs, "'no matter how many homes I found for you, "'terrible things occurred. "'Then when you decided to handle your own affairs, "'the Daily Punctilio brought more and more news of your treachery "'with each passing day. "'And now that I've found you again, "'I see that once more an unfortunate event has occurred— and another guardian is dead. You should be ashamed of yourselves. The Baudelaire's did not answer. Dewey Denouement, of course, had not been their official guardian at the Hotel Denouement, but he had looked after them, even when they did not know it, and he had done his best to protect them from the villainous people lurking around their home. Even though he wasn't a proper guardian, he was a good guardian, and the children were ashamed of themselves for their par participation in his in unfortunate death. In silence, they waited while Mr. Poe had another fit of coughing, and then the banker put his hands on the Baudelaire's shoulders, pushing them toward the entrance to the hotel. "'There are people who say that criminal behavior is the destiny of children from a broken home,' he said. "'Perhaps such people are right.' "'This is not our destiny,' Klaus said, but he did not sound very sure, and Mr. Poe merely gave him a sad, stern look and kept pushing." If someone taller than you has ever reached down to push you by the shoulder, then you know this is not a pleasant way to travel, but the Baudelaire's were too upset and confused to care. Up the stairs they went, the banker plodding behind them in his ugly pajamas, and only when they reached the cloud of steam that still wafted across the entrance did they think to look back at the mysterious man who had offered them a ride. By then, the man was already back inside the taxi and was driving slowly away from the Hotel de Noumont. And just as the children had no way of knowing if he was a good person or not, they had no way of knowing if they were sad or relieved to see him go. And even after months of research and many sleepless nights and many dreary afternoons spent in front of an enormous pond throwing stones in the hopes that someone would notice the ripples I was making, I have no way of knowing if the Baudelaire should have been sad or relieved to see him go either. I do not know who the man was, and I do not know where he went afterward, and I do know... The name of the woman who was hiding in the trunk, and the type of musical instrument that was laid carefully in the back seat, and the ingredients of the sandwich tucked into... Oh, wait. Let me back up. 
I do know who the man was, and I do know where he went afterward, and I do know the name of the woman who was hiding in the trunk, and the type of musical instrument that was laid carefully in the back seat, and the ingredients of the sandwich tucked into the glove compartment, and even the small item that sat on the passenger seat still damp from its hiding place, but I cannot tell you if the Baudelaire's would have been happier in this man's company, or if it was better that he drove away from the three siblings looking back at them through the rearview mirror and clutching a monogrammed napkin in his trembling hand. I do know that if they'd gotten into his taxi, their troubles at the Hotel de Numas would have not been their penultimate peril, and they would have had quite a few more woeful events in their lives that would likely take 13 more books to describe, but I have no way of knowing if it would have been better for the orphans, any more than I know if it would have been better for me had I decided to continue my life's work rather than researching the Baudelaire story, or if it would have been better for my sister had she decided to join the children at the Hotel de Numont instead of water skiing toward Captain Wittershins and later water skiing away from him, or if it would have been better for you to step into that taxi cab you saw not so long ago and embark on your own series of events, rather than continuing with the life you have for yourself. There is no way of knowing. When there is no way of knowing, one can only imagine. And I imagine that the Baudelaire orphans were quite frightened indeed when they walked through the entrance to the hotel and saw the crowd of people waiting for them in the lobby. There they are, roared someone from the back of the room. The children could not see who it was because the lobby, the lobby was as crowded as it had been when they first set foot in the perplexing hotel. It had been strange to walk through the enormous domed room that morning, passing unnoticed in their concierge disguises, but this time every person in the lobby was looking directly at them. The children were amazed to see countless familiar faces from every chapter of their lives and saw many, many people they could not be sure if they recognized or not. Everyone was wearing pajamas, nightgowns, or other sleepwear, and was glaring at the Baudelaire's through eyes squinty from being awakened in the middle of the night. It is always interesting to observe what people are wearing in the middle of the night, although there are more pleasant ways to make such observations without being accused of murder. Those are the murderers. They're no ordinary murderers, cried Geraldine Julian, who was wearing a bright yellow nightshirt and had a shower cap over her hair. They're the Baudelaire orphans! A ripple of astonishment went through the pajamaed crowd, and the children wished they had thought to put their sunglasses back on. Baudelaire orphans! cried Sir, whose pajamas had the initials L.S. stenciled over the pocket, presumably for lucky smells. I remember them! They caused accidents in my lumber mill! The accidents were not their fault, Charles said, whose pajamas matched his partner's. They were the fault of Count Olaf. Count Olaf is another one of their victims, cried a woman dressed in a pink, br a bright pink bathrobe. The Baudelaire's recognized her as Mrs. Morrow, one of the citizens of the village of Faldevotes. He was murdered right in my hometown. That was Count Omar, cried another citizen of the town, a man named Mr. Lesko, who apparently slept in the same plaid pants he wore during the day. I'm sure the Baudelaire's aren't murderers, said Jerome Squalor. I was their guardian, and I always found them to be polite and kind. They were pretty good students, if I remember correctly, said Mr. Ramora, who was wearing a nightcap shaped like a banana. They were pretty good students, if I remember correctly, Vice Principal Nero mimicked. They were nothing of the sort. Violet and Klaus flunked all sorts of tests, and Sonny was the worst administrative assistant I've ever seen. I say they're criminals, Mrs. Bass said, adjusting her wig, and criminals ought to be punished. Yes, said Hugo. Criminals are too freakish to be running around loose. They're not criminals, Hal said firmly, and I should know. So should I, retorted Esme Squalor, and I say they're as guilty as sin. Her long silver fingernails rested on the shoulder of Carmelita Spatz, who was glaring at the siblings as Mr. Poe pushed them past. I think they're guiltier than that, said one of the hotel bellboys. I think they're even guiltier than you think they are, cried another. I think they look like nice kids, said someone the children did not recognize. I think they look like vicious criminals, said another person. I think they look like noble volunteers, said another. I think they look like treacherous villains. I think they look like concierges. One of them looks a bit like my mother. Wrong. 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 The lobby seemed to shake as the clock struck three in the morning. By now, Mr. Poe had escorted the Baudelaire's to a far corner of the lobby, where either Frank or Ernest was waiting next to the door marked 121 with a grim expression on his face, as the last wrong echoed in the enormous room. 
Ladies and gentlemen! The children turned to see Justice Strauss, who was standing on one of the wooden benches so she could be seen, and clapping her hands for attention. Please, settle down! The matter of the Baudelaire's guilt or innocent is not for you to decide! Well, that doesn't seem fair! remarked a man in pajamas with a pattern of salmon swimming upstream. That, after all, they woke us up in the middle of the night. The case is a matter for the high court, Justice Strauss said. The authorities have been notified and the other judges of the court are on their way. We will be able to begin the trial in a matter of hours. I thought the trial was on a Thursday, said the, a woman in a nightgown emblazoned with dancing clowns. Showing up early is one of the signs of a noble person, Justice Strauss said. Once the other noble judges have arrived, we will decide on this matter and other equally important matters once and for all. There was a murmur of discussion in the crowd. I suppose that's all right, grumbled someone. All right, Geraldine Julian said. It's wonderful. I can see the headline now. High Court Finds Baudelaire's Guilty. No one is guilty until the trial is over. Justice Strauss said, and for the first time the judge gazed down at the children and gave them a gentle smile. It was a small mercy, that smile, and the frightened Baudelaire's smiled back. Justice Strauss stepped off the bench and walked through the murmuring crowd, followed by Jerome Squalor. Don't worry, children, Jerome said. It looks like you won't have to wait until tomorrow for justice to be served. I hope so, Violet said. I thought judges weren't allowed to reach verdicts on people they know, Klaus said. Normally that's true, Justice Strauss said. The law should be impartial and fair, but I think I can be fair where Count Olaf is concerned. Besides, Jerome said, there are two other judges on the high court. Justice Strauss's opinion is not the only one that matters. I trust my fellow judges, Justice Strauss said. I've known them for years, and they've always been concerned whenever I've reported on your case. While we wait for them to arrive, however, I've asked the managers of the hotel to put you in room 121 to keep you away from the angry crowd. Without a word, Frank or Ernest unlocked the door and revealed the small bare closet where Violet had found the harpoon gun. We'll be locked up, Klaus said nervously. Just to keep you safe, Justice Strauss said, until the trial begins. Yes! cried a voice the children would never forget. The crowd parted to reveal Count Olaf, who walked toward the Baudelaire's with a triumphant gleam in his eyes. Lock them up, he said. We can't have treacherous people running around the hotel. There are noble, decent people here. Really? asked Colette. Ha! Count Olaf said. I mean, of course. The high court will decide who's noble and who's wicked. In the meantime, the orphan should be locked in the closet. Here, here, Kevin said, raising one arm and then the other in an ambidextrous salute. They're not the only ones, Justice Strauss said sternly. You, sir, have also been accused of a great deal of treachery, and the high court is very interested in your case as well. You will be locked in room 165 until the trial begins. The man who was not Frank but Ernest, or vice versa, stepped sternly out of the crowd and took Olaf's arm. Fair enough, said Olaf. I'm happy to wait for the verdict of the high court. <laughs> the three siblings looked at one another and then looked around the lobby where the crowd was looking fiercely back at them. They did not want to be locked in a small room, no matter what the reason, and they could not understand why the idea of the high court reaching a verdict on Count Olaf made him laugh. However, they knew that arguing with the crowd would be bootless, a word which here means likely to get the sub siblings into even more trouble. And so without another word, the three Baudelaire's stepped inside the closet. Jerome and Justice Strauss gave them a little wave, and Mr. Poe gave them a little cough, and either Frank or Ernest stepped forward to shut the door. At the sight of the manager, the children suddenly thought not of Dewey, but of the family left behind, just as Violet, Klaus, and Sonny were all left behind after that first day at Briny Beach and the dreadful news they received there. We're sorry, Sonny said, and the manager looked down at the youngest Baudelaire and blinked. Perhaps he was Frank and thought the Baudelaire's had done something wicked, or perhaps he was Ernest and thought the Baudelaire's had done something noble, but in either case, the manager looked surprised that the children were sorry. For a moment, he paused and gave them a tiny nod, but then he shut the door and the Baudelaire children were alone. The door of room 121 was unsur was surprisingly thick, and although the light of the lobby shone clearly through the gap at the bottom of the door, the noise of the crowd was nothing but a faint buzzing, like a swarm of bees or the workings of a machine. The orphans sank to the floor, exhausted from their busy day and their terrible, terrible night. 
They took off their shoes and leaned against one another in the cramped surroundings, trying to find a comfortable position and listening to the buzz of the arguing crowd in the lobby. What will happen to us? Violet asked. I don't know, Klaus said. Perhaps we should have run, Violet said, like you suggested, Klaus. Perhaps at a trial, the middle Baudelaire said, the villains at last will be brought to justice. Olaf? Sonny asked. Or us? What Sonny asked, of course, was whether Count Olaf was the villain who would be brought to justice or if it would be the three Baudelaire's, but her siblings had no answer for her. Instead, the eldest Baudelaire leaned down and kissed the top of her sister's head, and Klaus leaned up to kiss Violet's, and Sonny moved her head first to the right and then to the left to kiss both of them. If you had been in the lobby of the Hotel de Numont, you would not have heard anything from behind the thick door of room 121. As the Baudelaire's ended their conversation with a great shuddery, shuddering sigh and nestled close to one another in the small space. You would have had to be on the other side of the door, leaning against the children yourself to hear the tiny quiet sounds as the Baudelaire orphans cried themselves to sleep, unable to answer Sonny's question. It's the end of chapter 10. Let me catch up. I'm very upset by that Tara saying the internet is upset by everything. Tara's the internet as well? And I interrupt French gasps. Oh, no, no, no. Oh. We should call for delivery. I stole a cookie from the cookie jar. Yeah, it's the I see, I saw chapter. I meant, who making me? Keegan wants to know why you're not streaming Pokemon. Because I don't want to interrupt all my other projects to do just Pokemon. <laughs> I don't know if all people who quote great American novelists are not treacherous. <laughs> True. I feel it lurking, except for the one hour where I did lurk. That's fine. It does happen to us all. I know someone who quotes the most well-known lines of great American novelists to sound intelligent and good, but they had to look it up and didn't even understand the meanings of the quote. <clears throat> My cousin had an appointment for her baby today, and they sent her to the hospital to get tests, and she has to stay overnight because her labs were bad. I'm so worried. I understand being worried, but the good thing is that those appointments are, are designed for that sort of thing. And it's, it's good that they caught it at the time where they could just make sure that she's okay. And that medical technology and accessibility to hospitals is good enough that they can keep her overnight and check and make sure everything's okay. So I completely understand being worried. I would be worried too, but just, just know that it's so much better that it was caught now than for it not to be caught until later. And so find uh, good things in that. But yes, we are definitely hoping the best. Because of course that's scary and you don't want any, even if it's, you know, just, it's at the very least a stressful day and you don't want that for them. I think they should stop worrying about what they look like, yeah. All the kisses. Yes, so that's all I'm going to read for this stream. So, since I'm splitting this book into four parts, for part four, we'll read chapters 11, 12, and 13, and then we'll be done. So, I'd like to try to do that soon. I say that, and then... So, here's what I'm going to do. I was supposed to babysit Thursday morning before I go to work. That's kind of very up in the air right now. I actually don't know if that's going to happen, because stuff just keeps changing. So, if I don't have to babysit Thursday morning... I'm going to finish this book. That's going to be my plan. Is that morning I'll, I'll finish it. I have a little bit of a headache. Oof. You're welcome for the stream. Um, hey friends, hope you're all well. Ben, thanks for the story. You're a great narrator. It's fun to listen to. Oh, thank you so much, gamer. I hope you're doing well. It's been, it's great to see you. It has been too long. Thanks for listening while you were doing other stuff. I hope you enjoyed. Um, anyway, okay. Have a wonderful night, friends. Um, I'll be back tomorrow for Best Wednesday with Holland. That'll probably be around 2.30 or 3 o'clock. And then we'll go until 6. You're welcome for the stream. Uh, just keep us updated. 
a page because, you know, I want to make, I want to know how everything turns out, but I'm sure it's all going to be okay, as scary as it is right now. Have a great day, everybody. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you all soon. Um, and for everybody on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this installment. Sorry that it's taking so long. Life is just busy, but thank you for being patient, and I'll have this last part to you hopefully within a week. Bye-bye.